Uh, Peter, thanks for joining me again, friend. Hello, Tasha. It's really good to see you. Yes, likewise. So after our last episode, I think there were some things that you wanted to share more about. And also uh, you shared your manuscript with me for the future book. And I quite liked that. And um, I think you also saw my video of open questions that I have about Alexander Technique. So there's a lot we can talk about. And uh, maybe just to start, if you remember anything uh, that you wanted to share about, you know, further thoughts that you had after our last conversation, I'd love to hear those. Well, I, I I watched your your video with questions about the Alexander technique when mm -hmm. it first came out, and I was a bit frustrated because mm. I didn't have an opportunity to answer it. But I watched it again this morning, and I'm glad to have an opportunity to answer it. But I, I watched the video, the the podcast you did with me, and um, there were two things that really interested me about it. And one of them was, I keep looking up there. <laughs> I'm not convinced by the NLP thing of you look that way when you're thinking and you look that way when you're lying. But that's not what I'm doing. I can see the sky through the trees there. And I could spend the entire time looking at you or looking at my tea, currently the two most important things in my life. But I like looking at the sky. So every time I look that way, I'm looking at the sky. The other thing that was interesting about it was that I, I wondered why you asked me what the benefits of the Alexander technique have been for me. And I wondered why I had to say, I made a list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was a rather feeble list. Mm. And thinking about it, I realized that the benefits I've got from it are so, now so incorporated into my life. I can't remember when I didn't have them. And they are mainly, my body is so light and easy, I can't feel it. And uh, most of the time I have no words in my head. So I sort of don't exist. Hmm. And I've, I've, uh, I've got so used to that, I had to make a list of the other benefits that come from it. And the, the, um, the uh, video you made with questions about the Alexander Technique, you asked something about com com how does it compare to Buddhism or, or what you've learned from Buddhism. And I've been thinking about all these spiritual practices and the admonition in Christianity, for instance, to love love your neighbor as you love yourself. You know, what is what is that for? Are, are Christians being told to do that to obey God? Are they being told to do it so or do they do it so that they'll go to heaven? Or are they doing it because it will enhance their lives and make the world a better place? And I think I, 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 I wouldn't want to do any kind of Alexander, any, any kind of spiritual practice if it didn't enhance my life and mm. potentially make the world a better place. And I think this way of living really enhances my life, has enhanced my life. And, um, and, and in all sorts of ways, um, if everybody did this, uh, would make the world a better place. You know what you said about benefits um, th that your you know your body body is relatively peaceful and that your mind is relatively quiet. Um, you know I, I can sort of see the advantages of that from my own experiences, but I could imagine it being non obvious to someone that that would be something that you'd want. Could you say more about why someone might want that? Well, I was having a conversation with an Alexander person recently who said that they want to be aware of their body because that is embodiment, embodied, mm -hmm. not the right word. I don't think it is. Mm. I think that is creating a separation. Mm. Which bit up here is aware of one's body? Mm. I don't think dogs and cats go around aware of their bodies i don't think my lovely cat sigmund thinks about his body he doesn't ever decide what shape it should be or um or change the way he moves he just if if i hold out my fist and he does all that stuff to it perhaps he knows he's got a body and when he lies in the sun perhaps he knows he's got a body uh, or if he's stung by a wasp he almost certainly does know he's got a body. But the rest of the time, why would you want to go around aware of your body, thinking about your body, making choices about your body, getting feedback from your body? Your body knows what to do if you leave it alone. Hmm. And I'm not talking about having a peaceful body. I'm really not talking about a peace, having a peaceful body. I currently have side effects from my 
chemotherapy and I feel nauseous but so my body is giving me it's not peaceful it's giving the feedback I, I need to know I don't need to go around going am I nauseous today no I'm not okay that's okay um am I tense today yes I'm tense your body will give you the feedback you need hmm. it's a very different uh at least to my to my ears a very different uh perspective than a lot of what I've been exposed to. And I mentioned that in that video, but where we're body awareness often in, in, in Buddhist practice, and I think a lot of meditative traditions is really considered to be like, like a virtue to cultivate. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of, I, I still feel very amateur at, at this, uh, but there's various things that I've been exposed to through various body practices where it seems like heightened body awareness is in fact useful. And it, I, I'm, I'm, wondering about the extent to which it's just a different approach or um complementary yes. or yeah yes and and and, um, and what do these things mean in words i i i wrote um in in my new book about um someone who every time someone i was teaching every time they stopped walking they would move their weight from foot to foot and ask them what are they doing they said they were grounding themselves mm. where did that come from yoga they said mm -hmm. what does it mean and they said i don't know mm -hmm. so the yoga teacher has told them to ground themselves and they've had to interpret it their way and for all they knew they were already grounded you know the yoga teacher says it to a whole group some of them will already be grounded so we interpret what we hear from our teachers through what we already believe mm -hmm. and i i think there are a lot of people there was a woman i, I can't mention her name because we've been we're being recorded there was a woman who became a unit of measurement i i, I i'll um i've called her joan she used to come in for a lesson and uh, i would say how are you and she said, i had a really interesting week and this happened and now look i'm just a head and a finger now if i live like this this is 100 joan units um if if I live like this, then I really do need to get back in touch with my body. Mm. But other people are very, oh, I'm so heavy and stodgy, I'm going to move. Other people are really aware of their bodies. So I don't think there's a one, I don't, I don't think there's one way of describing this that every, mm. uh, what, what the, the, the Buddhist teachers are looking for, that will get it across to everyone. Mm -hmm because we all differ and it's possible that what they're asking for is uh is um exactly what i'm looking for <laughs> but i i i my my memory is so uh bad currently i can't remember much of what i said in the last video but when i was until i tell you about um changing the way i walked i don't think you did when i was about 12 or 13 um we had to go into chapel at school every day and there were ceramic um flagstones or tiles and my friend had got new shoes with metal heels and they clicked as he walked in and i was so envious so i went up to the cobblers up in clifton and i got some heel taps and i banged them into my heels and as i walked into chapel my heels clicked but not as loudly as his and I suspect it was because sound travels better that way than it does that way. Mm. So I could hear his better than I could hear mine. But I started banging my heels down so that I could hear my... I, I altered the way I walked. I already had a way of walking that nature gave me. Mm. And then when I was about 15, I decided to change how I walked. I, I'm a bit of a nerd. I better walk like i'm cool and then for three days you have to go oh no hang on don't walk like that anymore how do i walk now oh yeah look what i'm doing i'm taking a bit of consciousness in there to control something that would have happened anyway to adjust something that would have happened anyway and i suspect that bit of consciousness is tied up in there for the rest of one's life hmm until one finds a way of liberating it and the reason i think this is three times while i was training to be an alexander teacher twice in my second year and once in my third year i had this experience of going whoa this is what it's like to be alive what have i been doing as as consciousness was released from controlling my body 
to come back out into all this. If we go in there to be aware of our bodies or control our bodies, we become less conscious. Hmm. And and uh, I think I, on the whole, our bodies know what to do. Hmm. We don't need to go in there and change the shape. We don't need to control how we walk. And I think there's something else I may have said. I think you've heard me say this before, but I, I don't think I said it in the last video, that uh, the last um, podcast, that um, Alexander teachers post pictures of small children on their websites. Does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To illustrate the abuse, well, I'll say it again because some people won't have seen the first Please one. Do. To illustrate the beautiful physical functioning that we had when we were small, that we diminish and that we can get back using the Alexander technique. And it's true. We, we can get back the light, easy, effortlessly upright thing that we had when we were children. But small children have a lot of other things that we diminish over time as we get older and that we can get back through the Alexander work. And they are um, they have a wide range of emotions, that, emotions that they move on from very quickly. They're interested in the world around them. They have a curiosity about the world around them. They are open to learning. In fact, children are really efficient learning machines. They dance like no one's watching. They sing like no one's listening. They know how to. They have a desire to, an urge to, and they know how to find things that make them happy. They don't put up with boredom and unhappiness, as so many of us do. Unconditional love. These are the benefits that I've been gradually, increasingly getting for the last 30 years and, and that I'm um, teaching to others. We really getting consciousness out of control of my thinking and out of controlling my body and out controlling my sense of humor. Oh, yeah. How many times a day do children laugh? Mm. Yes, yes, that's very funny. That's very funny. It's using the wrong bits to appreciate a humor. So we talked last time about uh, unity quite a bit. And then, you know, in your manuscript, you had an example of illustrating this that I thought was quite good of that. You'll ask people to wiggle their toes and they'll wiggle their toes, but also, you know, scrunch up their face or what have you. And mm. um, that got me wondering about, um, OK, so Alexander Technique, as you as you presented, is really about mind, body, spirit, unity. And uh, that that example really helped me make sense of it. But how is it that um, practicing Alexander technique cultivates that unity? Well, I this is going to sound really pedantic, but I'm not keen on the word practice. Mm -hmm. And here's the bit that sounds pedantic. Um, when people ask me, what should I do to practice it? I say, don't practice it, put it into practice. Mm -hmm. You know, apply it, apply it to your life. While I'm teaching people I'm teaching people unity, and if they do the things that I show them in the lessons, increasingly, um, I, I, I can get all the principles of the Alexander technique across to people in 10 minutes of playing catch, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where they discover that they that it works better if they don't do all the things they've been told to do all their life, if they don't try, if they don't focus, if they don't concentrate, if they don't keep their eye on the ball, mm -hmm. it all works better. And I frequently say to them, you know, I'm not teaching you a new way of playing catch. I'm teaching you something really profound. The observational aspect will see the ball. The decision-making bit will decide whether to catch it. And the system will organize your hand to go to it without all this stuff. How do you then apply it? Oh, hang on. I just have a sip of my tea. Oh, look what I just did. I did that the old way. I can have a sip of tea the way we play catch. Oh, hang on. I think this is my lovely girlfriend. Oh, look what I did. I can do it the way we played catch. Hmm. So I don't tend to use jargon. I don't tend to say, look, we're, we're learning unity. What? When I'm teaching people this, I say, look, isn't this a simpler, easier way of doing things? Yes. How have we done it? We've got your consciousness out here, leaving, consci getting consciousness uninvolved from your thinking and uninvolved from organizing your body. What's the relationship between that process of 
that that process that's happening there and in inhibition. Well, in, inhibition is, uh, and again, it's not it's not really a word I would use while I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. That inhibition is um, choosing or putting energy into not doing the thing you've got an urge to do. Um, so one one way of doing it is I say, well, don't catch this. I use very soft balls for this. Don't catch this one. And I throw them throw them a ball. And um, was it easy? Well, yes, but I really I really wanted to catch it, but I had to choose not to. Someone throws you a ball, you will sort of do that automatically. But to don't catch it, and the ball goes past your head. That choosing not to do the thing you've got an urge to do, that's the inhibition. And it applies to um, not doing that to that other driver. <laughs> it applies to, in my case, um, choose, uh, choosing not to have a beer this evening as a choice. <laughs> but going, I, I know I'm not going to have a beer tonight, even though they're in the fridge, they're calling me like Winnie the Pooh and his honey. <laughs> Remember that one? <laughs> <laughs> he was lost in the lost in the hundred acre wood, but he knew the way home because he could hear the honey calling him from, mm -hmm. from his house. That's inhibition, choosing not to do something you've got an urge to do. And if everybody learned to do that, that would change the world. But we can use it to change our change our habits. It's a really simple example, this strange thing that people used to do with paper diaries, and now they do them with the calendar on their phone. At the end of a lesson. We get our diaries out and people want to come and stand next to me with our phones almost touching so that we're sharing some com we don't look at each other's phones there's some weird and this man started crossing the room with it i said hang on you can deal with it from there and he said your phone is pulling me the phone wasn't pulling him his habit was pulling him and that choosing not to indulge the pull that's inhibition. I've just used it on holiday in France. I am not going to scratch that mosquito bite. I am not going to scratch that mosquito bite. That's inhibition. I noticed that it's easiest for me to practice inhibition with speech, where my experience is often um, I'll want to say something, and then I sort of pause and then a better version of what I want to say comes out, and it's it's less uh, mm. thought through, and it's but it it's works better. And Isn't that I'm, interesting? Isn't that interesting? The less thought through is the better thing. Isn't that interesting? And that's one of the benefits of having no words in my head. That, ladies and gentlemen, how long have we done? 15, 20 minutes so far. All I've done is open my mouth and words have come out. I haven't planned any of this. Mm -hmm. it, the, the the system is so I wonder if that's true what shall I say because I know I've now interrupted you about in, 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 look now I'm thinking about what I'm saying and the oh now I'll come back to this and so yes that's interesting it, the, the habit is to think about what you're going to say inhibition you choose not to do that and the other bit of you provides a better response perfect yeah, it's sort of an active question for me why it's relatively easy for me to inhibit with speech and then how to sort of cross apply that to other things because I'm not sure I'm doing it in other areas of my life or not. Well, um, you know, one of my eminent colleagues once said 30 years ago, you know, I could teach you this, but I can't learn you it. You, 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 you're inhibiting in that part of your life. Excellent. You experiment with moving it into other parts of your life. Anyway, you're so calm and peaceful. You don't want to do that at other drivers. You don't go, I'm not going to have a beer tonight. <laughs> and you probably go, oh, that, as a Buddhist, now I'm teasing you slightly, oh, that mosquito deserved, <laughs> it deserved to live, so I'm going <laughs> to... Well, I mean, I, I know you're joking, but let me push this a little bit. Oh, there is some truth in the joke. Well, no, yeah, so so there you are. You want to You want to slap the mosquito and you inhibit that. I mean, uh, is the benefit there just that simply that you don't kill the mosquito or because because in the case of the speech, in the case of the speech, I can see, oh, this came out better than it would have otherwise. But it it's sort of hard for me to see what the benefit is in other areas, even if 
uh, I'm aware of how to inhibit it, it feels like it's hard for me to see why that's useful in other carriers. I, um, I've, there are other ways in which I'd used inhibition in my life, including going into the polling booth and say, well, I usually vote for, well, hang on. Who shall I vote for this time? Listening to a politician on the radio and thinking, oh, this is the party that I usually hate. So they'll be, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's listen to what they're actually saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was um, uh, uh, doing a lesson just before this with someone who has seen the our, your previous podcast with me, and so he'll probably watch this. One of the things I do is I ask people to look at the world the way that dogs do. Have a look at the world the way that dogs do, everyone. No labelling, simply colours and textures and shapes and things that move. We were talking about, this client of mine and I were talking about identity. I'm from Wales. I think of myself as Welsh. I think of myself as British. I think of myself as a Londoner. And I think of myself as European. I don't ever think of myself as English. And any of those things that you say to someone else, they put you in a box. Um, oh, so-and-so is Jewish. Oh. So and so is gay. Oh, so and so is Chinese heritage. Oh, so and so is Canadian. Put them in boxes. Oh, so and so votes for that other party. If you come back to looking at the world the way that a dog does, you no longer put people in boxes. You see them as individuals. And inhibition goes, oh, that's the boy who bullied me. It's, oh, hang on. Inhibition is choosing not to do that and then making a fresh choice. Well, it's just someone I was at school with. How nice to see him. Mm -hmm. in, inhibition in action. You talked a bit been in the manuscript about um, the sort of ethical or moral benefits of Alexander Technique. And I'll, I'll just quote here. You said, according to Dewey and Aldous Huxley, we benefit morally too. Dewey experienced the, the, quote, great change in moral and mental attitude that takes place as proper coordinations are established. Um, can this, this issue about inhibition seems related to that, but can you say more about why uh, Alexander Technique would have ethical or moral implications? Well, I've, I've just described, I just described one to you that, um, that, um, Look, this is as deep in thought as you will ever see me. That I, I'm, I don't know what Dewey meant by moral. And Huxley, Aldous Huxley's wife wrote to someone saying that Aldous was having Alexander lessons and that he had benefited physically, mentally, and therefore morally. I think that that's the wording. But it, it's, it's very difficult to do habits when one is fully conscious. It's very difficult to do um, stereotyping when one is fully conscious. It's very difficult, I imagine. Um, <laughs> it, it's very difficult to do immoral things when you're fully conscious, when you're self-aware, when you're aware of 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 yourself um in every second i can't explain it any better than that i don't mm -hmm. think have tashin have a go and report back to me in a in a couple of weeks <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> now no, everyone just have a go and report back to us i think that's um I just ask because that that's certainly one of the areas of curiosity for me is, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've not been interested in just improving posture or, you know, getting in and out of a chair, the sort of things that you uh, sort of caricature in your manuscript of like, oh, these are the sort of limited ways of seeing Alexander technique, but, you know, everyday life and uh, moral improvement and, and supporting my spiritual path personally have been kind of the areas of interest for me. So. 
That's why I ask. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you're on this. You're on this journey anyway. Mm -hmm. For for those of you who haven't read the manuscript, it's um, it's it's a book for Alexander teachers. There's um, F. M. Alexander was born in Tasmania, and there are two plaques commemorating him in Tasmania, and one of them says, F. M. Alexander, discoverer of fundamental facts about functional human movement. Now that was written by an Alexander teacher, presumably. That is a fraction of what he discovered. Um, FM talked about um, the stupidity of party politics, that if we pause, inhibit, and reconsider the, the idea that we'll support a party, that we will disagree with what someone says because they belong to a different political party. We will automatically disagree with them because they belong to a different political party. It's completely bonkers. He talked about that and um, he talked about um, confirmation bias. We like to read things that we already agree with. We don't like to hear things that we disagree with. Um, the, the, the books are not about movement. They're about habits and choices and waking up and being conscious so i'm writing a book for the alexander world to because his books are so difficult fm's books are so difficult people tend alexander people tend not to read them and so the, i think the majority of alexander people do not realize the scope of the work a lot of them do but um, there are a lot of alexander teachers who really think he was teaching something about functional movement and um, I want the Alexander world to wake up to it before we fade away to nothing mm. and I, I I think that um, I was at this big conference in Berlin a few weeks ago and there was a lot I was I was so tired because it was a, a, a bad time in my cycle of drugs and I lay down a lot and there was a big meeting about marketing and this marketing woman said, it's, it's not going to work calling it the Alexander Technique. You know, put the Alexander Technique on your website. People will go, what's that? So, and what I do is so um, distant from the popular perception of what the Alexander Technique is with the public and with Alexander teachers. I, I really think I'm going to, it's going to take courage to do it. I'm going to distance myself from the Alexander Technique and start calling it mindfulness in 3d hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let me see what i've got on my notes i love my electronic notebook i know one of the things um i'd love to ask you about is the you know you watch this open questions video and uh i think one of the things i talked about there was sort of uh expanding one's awareness and the spatial side of that and you know whether there are sort of gaps in space or how big you can possibly make it and I would be curious to hear anything you might like to share about that. Yes this is something I'm wondering about currently having worked with a lot of Alexander teachers in Berlin um, Alexander teachers who came to my workshops and asked good questions about space um, is it we need, I think we need to separate awareness and attention. Mm. My attention is very strongly on you, but I'm aware of my room and the sky, my phone, my tea, my electronic notebook, my teapot, my watch, some currency, some vintage lenses, thing that I have here to inspire me, Idris Elba. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shouldn't you be writing? And uh, so I'm aware of everything, but my attention is on you. Mm -hmm. Now, if a giant spider started crawling across the wall, wall behind you, I would be going, passion, and my awareness would go into, that's what a narrowed awareness is for. It's what cats do. Cats have got really wide awareness. But if there's a bird or a mouse, I've got a mouse in my kitchen. I'm, I'm, at a very gen in very gentle war with a mouse. I've got a humane trap and various other things. I, it bounded in through my window, th through my, from my balcony, through the door while I was watching. It bounded in, waved to me, and then ran round behind my pile of books. So um, cats go, mouse, 
that's what it's for. But we, we use it for this, and we use it for this. When we were on the African savannah, we would have been aware of the horizon all the way around. That horizon is still there. It's just there are buildings in the way. Where's the horizon? We don't need to picture it. It's there. I've gone off calling it expanded awareness or expanding my awareness because it sounds like we have to do something active. The active thing is shrinking our awareness and when we stop shrinking it we bounce back out to this bigger thing for reasons that aren't worth explaining i've got four bootlaces on the floor here in various colors in fact i can't even remember why i started putting them there i know where they are i don't have to go oh yeah there are bootlaces oh am i aware of that but oh there's the sky there's the mouse there's my tea there are my boot laces. Oh, well, there are two of them. Simply being aware. Expanding awareness suggests you have to do something to expand it. You just have to stop not scrunching it. So on the African savanna, there's the horizon. You're standing in the middle of the African savanna. Somebody puts a perspex box around you. You'll still be aware of the horizon. If they take the perspex box off, and put on a smaller box with a few windows or a skylight in the roof, why would you no longer be aware of that space? Oh, I'm in a smaller space now. Yeah, there it is. Does that help? Yes, yes, definitely. I think um, to follow up, I, I, if your awareness, metaphorically speaking, were like a sphere, for example, I think in my experience, there's often sort of patchy spots where it's like oh I'm, I'm less aware of up here or behind here or something like that and I'm wondering how you might start to notice and open up those those spots well I recommend to people that they they experiment with this while they're walking or they're sitting on the bus or whatever that there, there's the texture of what I'm sitting on there's my peripheral vision our per, our peripheral vision is wider than 180 degrees. We can see behind our, I can still see this hand and it's behind my eye level. So there's everything that I can see, which includes this. And equally, there's the same amount of space that I can't see. That's interesting. What have I got to do? Like, oh, hang on, let's come back to the space. Yes, but I've got to step over that crack in the paper. Oh, and then let's come back to the space. So that's that's the place to put it into practice. Mm -hmm. It's funny, I've, re I've noticed recently while walking, um, for some reason, when people are walking behind me, and especially it seems to be if I can like hear their shoes clacking on concrete, I, I, I've noticed that I find that very unsettling if people are walking behind me but it's it, but it seems good to have awareness of that like it, it seems like that's a byproduct of sort of opening up the awareness to include behind me but it, i find it like subtly unsettling oh there's someone i I, I, I know what me. you mean i know what you mean there is something i remember being chased up the stairs by a, a sibling when i was a child and how scary it is that someone's chasing you from behind that sort of um uh or 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 driving and someone getting too close behind my car and there is a sort of sense of unease about it um I, I don't have it when I'm when I'm walking anymore unless somebody has silent shoes and then suddenly I mm. hear them mm. I'm, I'm pretty good at knowing what's um I'm pretty good at knowing what's behind me mm -hmm. um well I suggest you you keep experimenting with it and 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 see what happens I I I've um, I wrote in my notes that um, I, I I I recommend looking for expanded awareness for its benefits, not for its own sake. So we can go around saying, "Oh, I know how to have expanded awareness." Right now, I watch television. Mm 
that the, the benefits of expanded awareness and we don't have to expand our awareness or your body will only free up into space that you're aware of you know if i want i'm going to release my neck i'm going to release my shoulders you see where i am i'm in a small box i'm going to we're not going to free up if we're keeping our consciousness in a small space I get my consciousness out into that big space. Look, everything has freed up anyway. Hmm. So the benefits of that, the freedom. Um, if I'm living in a small space, my freedoms are only this big. Anything over there is theoretical. Oh, I could go and look at my astronomical telescope. I could theoretically, oh, I could go out onto my balcony and pick some of those chilies. I could, now I really could. Now I really could. Living in this bigger space, um, I, I really have freedom too. When when you're working with someone, what do you see when they have that freedom too? Because I, I know when I was at the last workshop, like mm, how to put this, it seemed like I could start to discern if someone say had their awareness expanded, but didn't have the freedom to, or didn't have this goodness. And what it, what it, what do you notice when you see that? Well, um, I, I'm smiling because you sort of answered the question. Mm. Tashin, I'm taking off your white belt mm -hmm. and I'm giving you, I don't know, yellow, orange, whatever, uh -huh. but it's not a black belt yet. Uh -huh. And you've already started to notice that you've started being able to discern when people are, well, cool. The more you do of it, the more obvious it will become. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and it's something that can't be put into words. It's funny. One of the experiences I had when, when I came back to the States, I went to uh, a Tai Chi class and a Qigong class from Stanwood, who I've had, who I've had on the podcast. And, um, you know, it was a very good, I, I went to several. And this the first one that I went to it was a very good Qigong class. It was, it was a Qigong class and then a Tai Chi class back to back. And, uh, you know, there's maybe 12 other people at each of them. and um, very good on the level of the Qigong and the Tai Chi, very helpful to me, polishing up my Tai Chi, for example, but it was even better with the Alexander eyes of having just, you know, worked on it because um, what I noticed was in particular was, uh, well, one, really seeing everyone's awareness and where they were spatially, which is very interesting. Some people very collapsed, not helpful for for that kind of class, but, but even more than that, um, something of like, I noticed Stanwood would give sort of instructions to the class. And one of the instructions uh, just kind of didn't feel right for me at the time. It was like about how fast you were supposed to walk. I was like, I'm going to walk at my own pace. And it was fine. And then afterwards, someone was like, um, oh, I didn't, I didn't want to walk that fast. I wanted to walk at my own pace, but they still just followed the instructions that he'd given, you know, uh, and I, I just don't think it occurred to them that they could not walk at the speed that he recommended like they have control over their own body they could walk mm -hmm. at whatever speed they want to even if someone mm -hmm. says to do something different so it's very fascinating to watch that context with with those sort of uh things in my awareness yeah someone described the alexander technique as a pre-technique for anything and i haven't yet found anything that it um that it wouldn't enhance learning it learning it wouldn't enhance how can this be well because i'm teaching people how to be your authentic self in the here and now there is nothing else there is nothing else we can do anything better being our authentic selves in the here and now we can we can form better relationships if we're our authentic self and in the here and now i expect we can do our spiritual practices you know i i as someone of no religion um, I don't feel any urge to do spiritual practices, but I think this work is profoundly spiritual. Uh, as someone of no religion, I think this work is profoundly spiritual. Um, we can do physical things better. We can be creative better. We can be happy better. Um, I mean, it's the punchline in my first book, Mindfulness in 3D. Um, when I was at the Berlin conference, uh, when I did my workshops, I was able to say mindfulness in 3D, available from me, holding up a copy of it, or from all good bookshops 100 meters from here, because the, the conference had a, had a bookshop. Mm. 
uh, we, 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 the, the punchline of the book is that I think the Alexander Technique um, enables us to be happy. Everyone is responsible. Uh, everyone's responsible for their own happiness and blowing your horn like that won't help. Everyone's responsible for their own happiness and Alexander Technique is the means whereby to achieve it. Mm -hmm. you make we, we we when we stop being on autopilot and start making choices we we can make choices about what we do with our lives we don't have to do what uh, our families wanted us to do you know for for a living we don't have to put up with that relationship that's dragging us down we don't have to to um make making money the priority in our lives uh, freedom to let go of, of all that stuff remember what i said about playing catch those things that you're trained to do you have to focus you have to try you have to think you have to concentrate you have to keep your eye on the ball everything works better if you stop doing those things and once you question all those ideas you had about how to do something like throwing cat throwing and catching a ball you can question everything else who you vote for do i really when I was um, when I was twelve, I had a go at being interested in football, soccer, because that's what everyone my age was doing. And then I thought, well, I'm not really interested. I had a go at being interested in Christianity because that's what some of my friends were doing. And I thought, well, I'm, I don't really believe this. Then I had a go at being interested in cars when I was in my early twenties, and then I thought. I'm really not interested in cars. I'm doing it because that's what all the men my age are doing, you know, being able to, and that's before I discovered Alexander, being able to be our authentic selves instead of fitting in with what family and society and uh, um, want us to, putting ourselves in boxes as well as putting other people in boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Let me ask another specific question, I think, um, one of the questions I had in the, that video was uh, about how non-doing and how to non-do more. And uh, I realize it's sort of a paradoxical <laughs> question, but again, it's sort of- I know what of... you mean, but put like that. I'm, and I, and I, I wasn't laughing at it because it was the wrong thing to say. It's one of those weird things that, um, you know, we're talking about things that can't be put into words. I and mean, how do I do non-doing more? Well, it's so simple. Um, you, you, you and Andy came up with this word couldness. When were you last there? June? You weren't there in July when Galit was there, were you? Yeah, it was June that I was last there, yes. Okay, when, when Galit was there. Um, maybe in June, Andy said, I think it was in June, Andy said, um, you keep saying it's simple. And I keep making it simpler, but now I've realized it's nothing. It is, it's nothing. There's nothing spiritual or magical about non-doing. It's simply, now I'm doing explaining, and now I'm just being someone who happens to be explaining. Hmm. Now I'm looking at the sky. Now I'm someone who just happens to be pointing his eyes at the sky. Oh, I just checked my, now I'm doing picking up my phone. Now I'm non-doing picking up my phone. Mm. It's really, really simple. Mm. But it's the opposite of what we're trained to do. Try harder, focus, come on. Put put your back into it. Pick your phone up. No, pick it up properly. Oh, okay. That kind of <laughs> what we're trained to do. It's so simple. Tashin, go and live in that bigger space. You want all that world behind you and your pull-up bar on the mm -hmm. on the door and the lovely light out of the window. It's too early to sing moon. Hmm. Yeah, this question uh, comes from again like noticing that uh the non like I'm able to non-do in certain contexts. And again, I notice it most with speech for some reason, but um I, I think it happens in other contexts as well, but it, it seems sort of limited to certain areas and not not free to happen in other areas as well and i'm not even sure in some cases what it might look like if i was not doing in some areas of my life or something like that well i've been 
this year in November, I would have been teaching this for 29 years. I had three years of training before that, and I had two years of lessons before that. So that's 34 years since I had my first Alexander lesson. Don't tell anyone else, but I lose it, and I catch myself doing, and I catch myself losing space, and I, I we're not looking for perfection. We're looking at getting better at it. Mm -hmm. Like when I used to go to tango classes, uh, I used to watch the teachers at the end, they would, you know, the ta uh, Argentine tango was improvised. And they would say, today, we're going to learn, now find three ways in and three ways out of it. And uh, at the end, they would dance together, incorporating this move that they taught us in all sorts of ways. And I used to watch them thinking, I'm never going to be that good. Why do I bother? Well, I'm just going to give up. I'm never going to be that good. And then one day I went on the dance floor in a practice session and I was dancing and I made a mistake and I laughed about it and I had another go. And I thought, well, that's good enough. Now I know that um, this is enjoyable enough for me and now I will learn. But I don't believe my teachers never make mistakes. I don't, don't believe my tango teachers never make mistakes. So, uh, and there's all that again. I was doing that partly to remind me. So, yeah, but you, you, you're, you're, you're experimenting with non-doing. You're thinking about your awareness. You're thinking about space. Excellent. You've already incorporated into your life things that you hadn't really thought about until you met me, what, six months ago, mm. or until you met Michael maybe six months before that. Cool. It's a lifetime journey. Um, and, and to expect to 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 uh, get it easily or to get it all in one piece uh, and anything that anything that easy to get is uh, probably not va not valuable probably what are some ways that you notice non-doing in normal life well I said earlier I'm not um I'm not planning what I'm going to say. I'm just opening my mouth and words are coming out. Well, that's non-doing. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if it is. Now, now I'm doing having a conversation. Now I'm non-doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speech is the easiest one for me to notice. I, I think I do that. No, I non-do speech frequently. So, yeah. Excellent. I used to have a dark room. Um, I've got a... In the mid '80s to about 2000, I used to 15, 20 years. I used to carry a film camera with me all the time, almost all the time. And I've got an enormous collection of black and white negatives. I wasn't very good. I did have a darkroom. I wasn't very good at it, and I was sort of mechanical about it. And now I, those darkroom skills I use in Photoshop, and I much more non-do it. I much more allow my hand and eye to do it without um, without thinking or planning. I just sort of let it happen. Tango, which I haven't done for some time. Improvising on my harmonica, which I don't do anymore because I, ha I no longer have the blues. Uh, I was dancing with someone. I heard the voice in my head say, take her into a front ocho. And my hands took her into a back ocho. So the non-doing part of me ignored the wordy controlling part of me hmm. Hmm. i was so happy hmm. yeah now that you mention it i think i've started to notice similar things with uh you know I, I i draw and make art and uh i've been doing that for about a year now and uh you know start have started to notice that when i'm like making lines or something like that of so something will just appear that i didn't plan out or something like that and those drawings tend to look pretty good Excellent. Yes. Creativity. That's the excellent. Yes. That's what I'm doing with the dark rooming. Now I've just written something down because I really didn't want to forget it. Mm -hmm. I talked last time about my favorite book. I've said this to you, but one of my favorite books is uh, Zen and the Art of Consciousness, which was by um, an academic, Susan Blackmore, who studies consciousness and got into Zen through studying consciousness. And um, Oh, maybe I did say this last time. She said that she was, I, I, I 
in the book, at some point, she says she was driving back from a retreat. And the only awareness she had of self was that she could see her hands on the steering wheel. Hmm. But yeah, I, I recognize that. And then I heard her in a discussion with, she's an atheist, I heard her in a discussion with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And um, she said she was driving back from a retreat. And she reached the set of traffic lights, it was red traffic lights. And if she went one way, it would be a wide road, but there might be lots of traffic. If she went the other way, it was a narrow road, but it might be blocked by cows. And she heard herself say, let's see which way she goes. And when the lights turned left, turned green, she found herself going left. Mm. That's not trust the other bit to make the decisions. The other bit makes the decisions. I'm very aware that when I'm using words to make decisions, I have already made the decision and the words are repeating. The words are repeating the thought. Hmm. That's non-doing. What shall I have for dinner tonight? What have I got? To tonight, I'll just go to the fridge and I'll pick something like that and cook them. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we do need to plan. You do need to buy food, you know. <laughs> it's like that joke about, I heard it about a rabbi, but I think it would apply to, um, you know, Catholic priests or um, going, going into the cathedral and saying, help me win the lottery. You know, I, I'm in trouble. I need to win the lottery. And eventually this voice comes down and says, meet me halfway, buy a ticket. <laughs> uh, you know, we do, we do need to plan. Uh -huh. It doesn't need this kind of planning. Yes, yes. Is there anything uh, else that you'd like to talk about? Uh, no, there's one other thing, really, and that is about the advantages of being in the here and now. I, uh, I, I, I have um, various health things that I would rather not have. Now, I nearly called them health issues. I don't know if they're issues. I've got health things I'd rather not have. And I'm going to get a phone call from my consultant within the next hour and a half telling me whether my chemotherapy is still working. And one, one day, and I get ner slightly nervous every time because one day he'll say, no, you, you need to come in. And I've had surgery on my gum and uh, through my gum to the root of a tooth, and I've noticed that the uh, it started tasting salty, so it's the infections come back, and the gum is white. It's no longer pink; it's white. So I have to phone my dentist tomorrow. And am I nervous? No, because right now I'm here talking to you. When that phone goes, then I will allow myself to be nervous. Mm. I had to go for, a, I've actually had four of them now, bone marrow biopsies. I can, if you're interested, I can describe what happens. Sure. And I went for, the, oh, you do want to know? <laughs> ah, 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 Curious, ah, now that you mention it. I've had four. You lie on your side. You know where your sacrum is. Mm -hmm. They can, with a, a hypodermic needle, they can anesthetize the flesh and they can anesthetize the surface of the bone you know you, some people might think it's odd that you have to anesthetize bone but i can tell you from personal experience the bone is alive and full of nerves mm. they can't anesthetize into the bone and then they have this thing that they call a needle which has a handle and it's this long and it's hollow and they push it into the sacrum and then pull out a plug of bone and marrow about an inch long. And uh, yeah, I, I, in my 20s, before I was an Alexander person, I was so scared of dental pain, I didn't go to the dentist for seven years. Mm. I went to for my first um, biopsy, knowing I would probably scream, but simply intrigued by how painful it could possibly be and not nervous until I started getting nervous when I went to bed the night before and then when I woke up in the morning I was nervous rather than 
carrying it around with me for days beforehand. I, w- I was actually quite surprised, mm. thinking that I was going to be nervous for weeks, uh, for a week, because I only had a, a week's notice. So this this being in the here and now, you know, those those things are all in the future. That phone call's in the future. The dentist is in the future. The, the you know, we are all going to die. Death is in the future. And one of the positive things that's come from having this um, uh, uh, incurable blood cancer is that uh, I'm I'm very, very, very aware of mortality. Uh, Both the Stoics and the existentialists say you can't lead a full life until you've come to terms with your mortality. I've come to terms with my mortality. You're all going to die, people. You might as well come to terms with it now, and then you, you can get on with your lives better. It's worth doing what you want to do today. Hmm. Don't put it off for the future. I like that you, that description still involves nervousness. Like it's not like, oh, I never feel nervous or something. Oh, no, no, absolutely. No, no, I really feel nervous. And, and Andy said many years ago, before he started training as a teacher, he said he thought with the Alexander Technique, um, he would... If you learned the Alexander technique, you would never get stressed. But he discovered it was a bit like getting fit. When he got fit, he thought he would never get out of breath. But he said he got just as out of breath, but recovered really quickly. Mm-hmm. And with the Alexander technique, he didn't not get stressed. He got stressed, but he recovered from it really quickly. And uh, yeah, we're not we're not looking for going through the world in a new age haze of loveliness where we only have positive emotions and we never have negative emotions. No, I get scared. I get weepy. My range of emotions has opened up both ways. I laugh more, um, happier. Um, my my heart is open for really good relationships. While I get I get all those other things as well that we think of as negative. There's nothing negative about being feeling angry. There's nothing negative about feeling scared. It's just just an emotion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Presumably and then the other thing, let me say this, please, before I forget, and, mm-hmm. and that is, and then that's when we use inhibition. I'm really angry. I I personally have never managed to use intellect to stop myself from feeling something. You know, I'm scared. Well, you shouldn't be. Oh, well, I'm broken, aren't I? This is me as a child. Um, I'm scared. We We can't use intellect to change how we feel, try as we might but we can use intellect and choice to decide how we behave when we feel those things. The second time I went for a biopsy, um, at the first time I went with my lovely girlfriend to hold my hand. The second time she couldn't come, so I took my housemate Oz and I lay on my side and squeezing her hand. When the doctor went out, <laughs> Oz said, you think you had it bad. You just had a biopsy. I had to watch it happen. <laughs> <laughs> but when the, the appointment was an hour late, I sat in the waiting room, waiting for an hour. It turned out that a crash team was trying to revive someone in a room nearby. The whole place was tense and something in the air. And I had to wait there. I wanted to go home. I'd been through this before. I knew what was going to happen. I wanted to go home. The fear led to me having this urge to go home and inhibition and choice is that's how I feel. That's what I've got an urge to do. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stay. We cannot control our emotions. It's like I I shocked one of my trainees by saying when I was uh, much younger and had hormones, I had no control over my urges. What? You had no control over your urges? No, I had no control over my urges, but I did have complete control over what I did when I felt those urges. We we shouldn't try to control our emotions. We should learn to control what we do when we're under the, uh, when we're feeling those things. We shouldn't make decisions on the basis of anger or lust or fear or or love that may be temporary. There used to be a, a, qu- a questionnaire in The Guardian. Every week they'd ask a celebrity a load of questions, like, what do you always have in your pockets? 
And um, one of them was, have you ever said, I love you and not meant it? And my answer to that is, no, I've always meant it. I might not have said it half an hour later. <laughs> <laughs> so let's come back to that. <sighs> I imagine that what you're saying about still allowing yourself to feel emotions applies to the experience of pain too, because we might it's hope point that, yeah. Still allowing myself to feel. It's pointless trying not to feel them. Mm -hmm. Then we're creating disunity. You are feeling them. You're trying to cut off that bit. Yeah, just, just feel them. When you try to cut them off, you're still going to feel them. Absolutely. Yeah, go on. Well, I, I just imagine someone might, might think, oh, I'm going to get into this and never have pain again or something like that. But that's mm -hmm. not very realistic. And <laughs> instead, it's what you do when you have that experience rather than... Uh, you know, run away or something as you're sort of implying in that experience of like, oh, I might just leave before the biopsy or something like that. Yeah. Yes, I, I have, um, ha having said, I, I, I have no awareness of my body. I, I was very aware I had a body when that was going on. <laughs> yeah. I was very aware I had a body when I was having a, a surgery. Um, all, although actually the main thing I was aware of because I was so anesthetized, loco anesthetic, was that, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. <laughs> Yeah. My mouth forced open with clamps. Yes. Yeah. But, there, you know, and then there are there are special occasions when it's really worth knowing you've got a body. But the rest of the time, why do you want to be aware of your body? Mm -hmm. You are you are your body. Why would you want to be aware of it? Why do you want to be aware of yourself? You just when you that, that thing I said earlier about not existing, Susan Blackmore saying her only awareness of self was that she could see her hands on the steering wheel. And she got out of the way and allowed the other bit to choose which road to take. Yes, it's it's such an adventure discovering all this stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to mention or talk about while we're still talking? Um, I can't think of anything, but I'm just going to pour some more tea mm. because I'm very British. <laughs> I uh, that that putting people in. Putting people in boxes. Someone asked me earlier. He will watch this. Uh, what what time is it that you all stop? For tea? I'm paraphrasing that you all stop for tea in the UK. I mean, you know, putting people. In, um, that's a really funny box to put people in. We don't stop for tea. I think my grandparents' generation stopped for tea at four o'clock. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, I could talk about this for hours, but um, maybe I'll say something about. How how to get it across to people, for, for for those of you who didn't see this last time, or those of you unlike Tashin who's had the privilege, or they probably the um whatever the opposite of privilege is of of being there when I do this in real life of switching off my Alexander. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, I switched off my Alexander. Now this is just zero. Now I'm going to turn it down to negative. It's not pleasant, is it? No, I came up with the phrase animal cruelty for it because oh, yeah. it feels like. So, so, and I find this really difficult. I, this, I'm trying, I'm, I'm keeping myself at zero. No, I'm keeping myself at zero. I find it really difficult. Now, if we're teaching people from this, come on, have more freedom, have more aliveness, it's not going to, but if we model it for people, and for me, having done this for 30-ish years, I wake up with this. And to do this takes, I can't even talk when I'm doing it. I have to put effort into choosing this. But most people who come to me are somewhere around here, and they have to put effort into this. And when they stop putting effort in, they do. They go back to this. And there's a turnaround at some point. And it's at some point, um, yeah, there's a turnaround at some point where this becomes the, the it, it's easier to stay into this, in this. We have to choose to lose it rather than choose to have it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me again. It's been great to get some clarity on some of these things and always lovely to speak with you. So thank you, Peter. Well, thank you. And um, yes, it's always lovely and enjoyable to speak with you. I'm smiling at the word clarity. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I hope there has been clarity. Oh, and when we finish this, I'll probably write down about 10 things that I wish I'd said. Uh -huh. 
it's um I, I, I mean it's so difficult to put what, what is this how do you put this into words and and anyone listening to this be careful of interpreting it through what you already know. Mm. Oh, I wrote something down that you'd said, um, yes, about about um, what you said about Buddhism and um, em embodiment or awareness of bodies, that we have to be really careful. Sometimes we compare what we're experiencing to things that we've heard theoretically or read about and i've got a classic example um and that is uh the power of now you know i invite people into the here and now i'm pretty good at being in the here and now and sometimes people say well this can't be right why not because i'm not in bliss hmm. now hang on here's your experience of the here and now and you're comparing it theoretically with what toller says So I, we have to be really careful. Oh, but Peter said to be aware of space. You know, that isn't what we're looking for. Being my authentic self, oh, my authentic self is shy. You know, we have to be really careful interpreting all this through what we already know or what we already believe or what we've read or what someone else has told us. So, yeah, that's that's my thought for the day. Thanks for speaking with me, friend. <laughs>